Sorry, the line isn't that great. Um, I have a 300 megabit thing here that's on hardware, so I think mine should be okay. But you're kind of just dropping out a little bit. Welcome to the Becoming Superhuman Podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to bring you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. Greetings, super friends, and welcome to today's very special show. I got to start out by saying, wow, wow, you guys, because when we first started out doing the show, I had a list of 10 names, 10 people that I really, really admire, 10 people that I was just dying, dying to ask a few questions to. And uh, today we have one of them on the show. We're joined by a real life superhuman, uh, a man who's rose to prominence in two extremely competitive arenas. And honestly, if you ask me, Who is one of the finest examples out there of a super learner? I would have to give this person. His name is David Heinemeier Hansen, better known as DHH. And if you haven't heard of him, he's a software developer, an entrepreneur, and a race car driver, originally from Denmark. Now, he's most known for the company he co-founded called Basecamp and for developing the very popular Ruby on Rails web development framework that, quite frankly, has taken the world by storm. GitHub was developed on it, Twitter was developed on it, and so many other applications and programs that we use every day were built on this technology that he developed in his early 20s. Now, in 2005, he was recognized as Hacker of the Year by both Google and O'Reilly, and he's written a slew of books on software development and three very popular books on building and managing software companies. Those are Getting Real, Rework, and Remote. Now, if all of that weren't enough... David also has had a meteoric rise to prominence in the world of auto racing, climbing to the top of the ranks and coming in among the top spots in what many would call record time. And he's constantly posting incredible times, and he's just had such an impressive career there as well. Now, in this episode, I really wanted to deconstruct David's thinking process and figure out how the heck he learns so much so effectively. And I wanted to understand how he's been so successful in various entirely different worlds from business to software to auto racing, and then figure out, of course, for you guys, what tips he had to offer to anyone looking to live a life as diverse and rich as his. So we start out and we talk about how he manages his time and there's a ton of value there, but then we go really deep and we start to actually deconstruct his entire learning methodology in depth. And as I expected, he has some really powerful tips, some really amazing things that line up directly with the research, directly with the stuff that I would call a super learner habit set. We then go into flow, we go into habits, we go into happiness and goals, and we start to understand just how David has spent decades deconstructing and analyzing his own performance in every possible angle and in every possible aspect of his life. Quite honestly, you guys, I can say without exaggeration that this is one of the absolute best episodes we've ever done. I was sitting on the edge of my seat. Well, I was standing at my standing desk, but I was standing at the edge of my mat and just riveted the entire time. Now, if you guys enjoy this interview, I want to let you guys know that we do offer a class which puts many of these frameworks that David talks about today and many, many more like mnemonic techniques, speed reading, and everything like that into one comprehensive training. And that's called the Become a Super Learner Masterclass. If you guys want to take that, you can join us risk-free for 30 days and check it out and start to understand how you too can acquire these learning tips and strategies and skills and many, many more. So to get a very handsome discount on that program and get started today, please visit jle.vi slash learn. And now without any further ado, I'm very proud to present to you guys, Mr. David Heinemeier Hansen. Mr. David Hennemeyer Hansen, welcome to the show, sir. It's really such an honor to be speaking with you. I have to be completely honest. So thank you so much for making the time. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure to be here. Yeah, and I appreciate you being patient with our technical issues here. I know uh, it's really ironic to kind of like tech 
geeks, tech savvy folks, and we have all these Skype issues. So thank you so much for that. <laughs> yeah, the internet is still mysterious uh, for life. Isn't it? <laughs> David, I have to admit, I tried super hard to summarize your very impressive biography, but I'm really quite sure that I didn't do it justice in the intro. So I'd actually love to hear how you go about summarizing your journey up until this point. I imagine it's quite a challenge to fit into a concise summary. Sure. Well, yeah, it's really not that bad. I have a couple of things that I'm passionate about and that I've been working on for a long time. Obviously, uh, Basecamp, the company that uh, I've been a part of for the past, before we were called Basecamp, before there was a Basecamp, what now, 15 years I've worked with Jason Fried at uh, First 37 Signals, now Basecamp, where we make a, a piece of software that helps small businesses and teams and organizations keep track of all the work they need to do and keep top of things and in control. So that's my main sort of business. Uh, and as I said, I've been doing that for, for 12 years. We've been running Basecamp, the app, for 12 years now. I'm a, a founder and CTO there. And as part of that work on Basecamp, uh, I created something called Ruby on Rails, which is a web framework, a toolkit for people to create web applications just like Basecamp or Shopify or GitHub or Twitter was even started on that. Mm -hmm. And then... Those two experiences have given me a lot to think about. So I wrote a, a handful <laughs> of books, three books, um, Getting Real, Rework, and most recently, Remote. And then uh, finally, in my uh, spare time, I like to drive race cars. So I do that at uh, the 24 Hours of Le Mans and the Associated uh, World Endurance Championship. Incredible. You're literally the definition of a superhuman. You've got this Clark Kent uh, Superman thing going on. And I think probably the first question that most people are wondering is how? I mean, what makes you tick? Just your auto ascent, you know, your ascent in auto racing alone is really mind boggling when you look at the short number of years, but also to do all of this while building and maintaining a successful company and developing a whole new software development framework. I've got to ask, how do you do it? I mean, what makes you tick. <laughs> sure. It's funny because I often get that question. And to me, it's a little strange because I don't think there's any superhuman-ness about the way I go about work. A lot of it is just not doing a whole lot of work that perhaps others or I myself would have thought in an earlier time was necessary. There's a uh, a lot of things that we do in business and in hobbies and so forth that just aren't necessary and things you can mm -hmm. just cut out. So I, for example, if we, we take uh, the business and the technical side of things, it's not because I'm cramming 80 or 100 or 120 hours into things, not at all. And the way I got started with both Basecamp and Ruby on Rails was on a extremely modest time horizon. I was working with Jason Fried as a contractor, actually, to uh, 37 Signals back in the early 2000s. And I was in Copenhagen, Denmark. I was still going to school and I had 10 hours per week to sell him, basically. So that formative experience really cemented just how much you can actually get done in 10 hours per week if you make them count. And it just so happens that most people, most of the time, don't make their hours count. They chop them up, they take the workday and they turn it into little work moments. And if you have 10 hours, then you get 45 minutes here, an hour and a half there and an hour here. And that's really a great way to not get anything done at all. I've had days like that, uh, especially now when the company is um, a little bigger. We're almost 50 people now. I've had days where there are eight hours on the clock, but there's not eight hours to show for it afterwards. And a lot of that is to do with interruptions and how you spend the time. And especially when it comes to creative work, whether you're writing or designing or programming, you just can't jump into a good groove in five minutes. It doesn't work like that. So Absolutely. what usually happens is if I have an appointment or like this podcast interview, right? When I sit down at my desk, if there's 40 minutes until we have to talk, I'm not going to spend that 40 minutes in some deep thought on a piece of programming because there's just not enough time to get in and out and get something real done. So I'll, I won't say I'll waste that time, but I'll spend that time on other things that aren't moving Ruby on Rails or Basecamp, the application for it. I'll be answering my emails. I'll be doing a bunch of other things like that. And I think most people mistake the amount of time they spend in front of a computer or their workstation in general as work. Like, oh, I did mm -hmm. eight hours of work today. Eh, I'm not too sure you did. 
I'm sure you were <laughs> present for eight hours. I'm not so sure you did eight hours of work. And I think that that is the fundamental misconception that a lot of people are sitting with. And of course, they didn't think like, oh, how are you able to get all this done? Like I spend eight hours in front of a computer every day and I can't imagine getting all that done. Well, a lot of it is probably just how we spend those eight hours. Do we spend them in the same way? No, we probably don't. I very frequently, certainly at any time where I make material progress, get long stretches of uninterrupted time, as in hours. Mm -hmm. And I think in some ways, we're actually getting worse and worse of this at this. It's funny because one of the early applications we made at 37 Signals was a program called Campfires, a chat tool for mm -hmm. groups. And chat for groups have recently become all the rage again. And a lot of people are justifiably excited about how that sort of cuts down on email and cuts down on a lot of things. But it, it also creates this continuous distraction through the whole day where you're expected to hang yes. out in this one place and pay attention. So you have this partial attention deficit running your entire day through. And then people wonder like, oh, wow, we're working, we're collaborating, we're doing all these things, but we're not actually getting more things done. How is this possible? Well, because it's possible to freaking over collaborate and it's possible to spread your attention too thin. If you really want to make uh, breakthroughs on creative work, it pretty much has to be the focus. It can't be just one window out of four on your screen that you're paying attention to and you're seeing all your unread counters, ding, ding, ding. You're seeing all your notifications coming in and you keep half an eye on the company chat. Well, mm -hmm. surprise, surprise, you're not getting anything done. Wow. So... I've been conscious of that since I started working, perhaps in part because when I did start working with Jason, I was forced into this. So Copenhagen is seven time zones off Chicago, which meant that most of the work I was doing, I was doing not with overlap. I was doing it on my own. And then we had a couple of hours a, a week or whatever to sort of square up our notes and like, hey, I work on the right things. This is going in the right direction. But the majority of the time was not spent quote unquote, collaborating. So that's just one of the techniques I've used to great effect and I continue to champion is to get long, uninterrupted periods of time. And then all of a sudden, it seems like magic. I mean, there are days when I can really get into the zone, I can do in two days what would otherwise take me two weeks, if those two weeks were sort of the common corporate way of Work days where they're punctured by constant meetings and constant things to check in with. It's just not even on the same scale, on the same level that uh, you can extract productivity when you do it in a focused way. I know it sounds like sort of a cop out because people say, well, I, mean, I can just not like check my window for five minutes or whatever. And I just don't think most people have actually tried this, which is why I think most people are skeptical about it. Or perhaps they've tried right. it, but they have not tried it on a sustained basis. So it's easy to be skeptical that you can really get that much more done if you turn off your interruptions, unless you give it a proper damn go. It's not just like, oh, yeah, I didn't look at my email program for two hours. Well, what would he do? Right. Try doing that like for a whole day, then try doing that for a whole week, then try doing that for a whole month. And then now you'll see something different. You're totally speaking my language. I recently, we also have a distributed team here at my company and that's allowed me to do basically maker and manager days. So I have entire days. Thursdays are the only days I interact with humans. Well, Thursdays and Mondays. And then the other days I'm just making. So Slack is off. Email never has notifications, but basically I've stripped down all the distractions so that on Wednesdays and Sundays, I'm just making. I think that's a great technique to do it. I wish sometimes that I had the sort of discipline to split it up like that because I see the effects every single time when I don't try to petition it. Just days being lost where you look at the end of it mm -hmm. and like, this was not a good day's work. I did not get a right. good day's work done because it was just punctured by all these little things and constant context switching costs. Absolutely. I want to ask on, on another channel entirely. We got into a little bit of your time management. How do you learn? Because you've essentially, I mean, you've built an entire software development framework, which took, I imagine, a very solid learning of Ruby and of kind of the worlds of software development. But you've also learned this physical skill and this very complex skill of race car driving. So how do you go about, you know, as someone who teaches accelerated learning, I'm very interested in how you go about learning so much so fast. Sure. So I think the first thing is to strip out of your 
brain that there is speed limits to learning. That there is a certain pace, like oh, in year one you do this, in year two you do yes. that. Absolutely not. You can compress uh, most uh, sort of learning uh, trajectories into a much much shorter amount of time than most people do if you're willing to practice diligently and intently, and not just practice, but also put yourself in a situation where. It's not just about practice, but you actually feel like you're making progress. Like I'm a, actually a terrible learner when it comes to sort of abstract. Let me just learn a skill for the sake of learning a skill. For me, I need a purpose. So for yeah. me to learn Ruby and to create Ruby on Rails, the purpose was to build Basecamp. I wasn't just sitting down like, oh, let me learn Ruby from sort of A to Z. Absolutely not. I learned just enough, just the basics to get starting, and then every single lesson from there on out was because, like, oh, I need to do this. I wonder how I do that. Let me look it up. Let me find it out. <laughs> so that's the sort of approach I take, and then the environment I try to do as well is to quickly identify who's the best and mimic what they do. So in Ruby, it was. Reading a lot of code, not just in Ruby but also in Java and to small extent PHP, identifying sort of the successful open source projects and the successful pieces of code, and then really studying them. Again, not studying them in the abstract of oh, let me just study this piece of code because like that's what I want to study, but study them in the concrete sense of like I want to solve this next problem I have, and I want to solve it in the best way. Like if the best programmer in the world was sitting right. Next to me and was teaching me how to do this right now. Like that's the sort of environment I want to simulate, and that's I found to be surprisingly easy. There is a mountain of open source code out there. There's a mountain of instruction and teaching from really good people who actually know what the hell they're talking about, and you can tap mm -hmm. into that if you're interested. So that's what I did. I just I read a bunch of code whenever I hit a problem or a challenge that I wanted to conquer, and, and I dove really deep into it. I took most of the Ruby standard library apart and tried to learn from that. And the same is true for racing. So when I first got into racing, I mean, I didn't have any background at all. The only background I had was I had played a lot of racing video games, which I mean, <laughs> I guess to be fair, actually is a, a bit of a background. Uh, there's been some very interesting programs, including the GT Academy run by Nissan, where they were picking uh, gamers of uh, Gran Turismo and turning those into professional race car drivers. So there's definitely there's some parallels there. But for me, I didn't get my driver's license until I was 25. I didn't sit in a race car until I think I was almost 30. Those are not the hallmarks of someone generally who then gets to compete at a high level. Most of the right. drivers who get to compete at a high level, they started much younger, right? Like they were go-karting since they were six years old or whatever. But I used the same approach. I used the same approach of thinking like, I will figure this out. So I will figure out the language and the mechanics of what racing is. I will develop an eye for it. So developing an eye in racing is a lot of like, first you figure out the basics. Oh, what is understeer? What is oversteer? What's a slip angle? What's a good slip angle? And those are sort of the vocabulary. But racing, of course, as you say, is a physical learning. So it's about getting the um, seat of your pants sensation. And mm -hmm. you sort of, you pair those two together. So spend a lot of time just driving slowly in circles around track, making some mistakes, but then also sort of putting yourself next to the best you can as quickly as you can. So that includes studying race videos. YouTube is an amazing resource for onboard camera angles of various phenomenal drivers driving race cars and making it look incredibly easy, even though it's most certainly not. So I did that a bunch. And then um, I just kept moving through the feeder series as quickly as I could. I never had the ambition to be the fastest driver at my local track. Like that is an entirely uninspiring aspiration for me. I wanted to be the fastest amateur driver in the world. I mean, not really as a goal, but more just as a goal post, somewhere to aim towards. <laughs> it wasn't like a binary thing. Oh, well, I, when I get to that, I'm done. Or if I don't get to that, I screwed up or I failed. More as a goal post of like, why shouldn't I be? Like, why should I not be able to become the best gentleman driver in the world? Like, wow. I'm reasonably fit. I'm willing to put in the time and the effort to learn this. Like, why shouldn't I? So I think a lot of that, both as it goes to programming, as it goes to business, as it goes to racing, 
was sort of an indignation of thinking like there are a lot of <laughs> people in the world who sort of can become really good at something. Why should I not be one of those people? And I mean, when I say the best, I don't mean that in a literal sense of like one of one. I just mean like in the world today in sports car racing, there is a small handful of, I don't know, 10, 20, maybe even 30 drivers who are really sort of the best at the amateur level. Like there's no reason I shouldn't be able to join that club. So that gave me sort of perhaps the confidence from the get-go to say, like, there is nothing inherent that's keeping that from happening. I can make that happen. If I do the work, if I do the study, if I put myself in situations where I'm humble enough to realize that I will be the worst, slowest driver on the team, maybe even in the series, when I get started, then I'm going to learn really quickly. And there's a lot of people who are just not comfortable with that. A lot of people are not comfortable putting themselves in situations where they will perhaps look like a fool. I've never been afraid of that. I've never been afraid of looking like a fool because I was learning and because I was a beginner. To me, there was just this, I mean, phenomenal opportunity of accelerated learning. If I show up in a group of people and I'm already at the top of that group, I don't know. Maybe I learned something from teaching other people and that's certainly valid, but I don't learn as much or as quickly as if I was just one of the worst people in that group. Because then there's all these other people in this group for me to learn from really quickly. And what I found too is that both sort of people aren't that comfortable putting themselves in the beginner's shoes and putting themselves under the risk of looking foolish. On the flip side, most people who are really good at something, they really like when someone looks up to them mm -hmm. when someone approaches them and like, hey, how did you do it? Like, how did you figure that out? Like ask detailed questions about their craft in such a way that they can display and exert their experthood. So I did that a bunch. I just, I still do that. Both as it comes to programming wow. and as it comes to racing, just walk up to people who figured something out that I have not figured out and just go in like, hey, how did you do that? I want to learn wow. this secret. I want to learn this trick or this aspect or this angle of the discipline and you somehow you know how i want to get that out of your brain wow i have to say you're blowing my mind because i often tell our students that the world's most sophisticated learners figure out so much of the stuff that i'm always going on and on about in my courses like it's almost as if you were like reading off the crib sheet. I don't know if you like <laughs> cheated before the interview. <laughs> it's just like, like this is not a paid advertisement for our courses. But I mean, first you started off by saying you need to learn for a specific purpose. That's straight out of Malcolm Knowles, 1955 research. Adult learners need to have pressing need and immediate application for learning. So boom, right there. You're out of the gate already ahead to use a racing metaphor. <laughs> Then you go into like this experiential learning, what we call brute force learning. You're like, oh yeah, I watch on YouTube and I do this and I ask questions. And I think so many people would sit down with one Ruby book and they just read it from cover to cover. And you were saying, no, I read all kinds of different code. I read PHP, I read Java, I read this, I read that, I tried this, I tried that. So this kind of brute force learning approach. And then the third big similarity that I saw was just this idea of asking the right questions, knowing how to ask questions, putting aside ego and again, doing the brute force learning, but through conversations, through discussion, and through adopting the beginner's mindset. So I just, I just think it's incredible, like, kind of proves my hypothesis that you as one of, I would consider one of the fastest, most accelerated learners out there. You've just figured this stuff out intuitively in your journey. And I think, again, it's not because there's, at least for me, was some sort of deep discovery of rocket science. I just, I tried different things and like, these were the things that worked. And when totally. I found these things to work in one domain, I just took that template and applied it to something else. I've applied this template to driving a race car. I've applied this template to learning photography. I've applied this template to being a public speaker. There's just like there's a way of learning that uh, applies just to most domains. And once you sort of find that to be successful in one domain, it's not that hard to just basically say, hey, copy, paste. Let me go back to yeah. square one and then I'll apply the same thing again. Although I will say too that I've seen people who did follow some variety of this approach in one domain and then they become really good at that domain. And then again, they have an ego that's stopping them from going back to being a beginner, which then prevents them from learning mm -hmm. another domain as well as they learned their first. And that's a real shame. And I think that that 
mixture of both knowing the technique of how to learn something, but also having just the, I don't give a shit what people think. Like, I don't give a <laughs> shit if people think I look like an idiot or ask too many questions or I'm poor in the beginning. Just because, like, I'm an expert in one area does not, by any stretch or extension, make me an expert by default in another area. And Absolutely. if you just embrace that and just don't give a shit what people think, then it becomes so much easier. And I think just so much quicker. Absolutely. So your template is essentially... Learn based on what you need. Ignore the recommended timeline. If I could just reiterate. So ignore the recommended timeline. Learn the things as you need to know them. Take in as many sources as you can. Adopt the beginner's mindset. And then just put your ego aside and ask as many questions as you can possibly draw up. Yeah, absolutely. That's a... There's some patterns there. I think it's a whole pattern language of learning. And all those patterns are relevant to the trajectories I've taken in these many different domains. Incredible. So let me ask this. I mean, obviously the learning toolkit, you've applied to many different things. And I, by the way, I saw your photography and obviously you're very skilled in that arena as well. Have the actual things that you've learned, for example, does the structured way of thinking that you've developed in your business help you when you're on the racetrack or vice versa? Yeah, I think in these overall senses of developing systems thinking, critical theory, and, and all of these sort of tools that are not just like the template of learning, but also the templates of thinking, I apply those exactly the same yes. way. That's in part of why I love race car driving so much, because it's so similar to programming in the sense really? that you get immediate feedback on whether the thing you tried worked or didn't work. In programming, you run the program and either it worked or it passed its unit tests or testing in general, or it didn't, right? It's a very binary distinction. In race car driving, you do a lap and then you try something different. You try to break it deeper in here. You try to trail break. You try to do other things. And then in usually about two minutes, you get the answer <laughs> because you mm -hmm. get your new lap time. Did you improve? Did you not improve? If you improved, excellent. The thing you did just worked. Now there's a feedback loop and now you can proceed. And not only just in the car, but also outside the car. I think of software as the whole system with feedback loops and running a successful race programming is very much the same thing. You have the driver who tries to do the very best that they can on track, but then you also have a whole team behind it who needs to execute perfect pit stops, who needs to have perfect strategy, who needs to root cause, analyze any failures and faults. Um, they're very, very similar. Like the retrospective wow approach I try to apply at the race teams I'm on is almost identical to the retrospective approach that I try to apply when we have a failure at base camp for some technical issue of like, oh, we were just down because like this thing failed. And like the way you ask questions, the way you interrogate the problem, it's just the same. It's critical thinking wow. and it's sort of deduction and it's the same tools and techniques you can apply to all these domains. Perhaps a little less so to some of the creative domains that are more just mm -hmm. totally creative. But even that's not even fully the case. I was going to say like photography is not quite like that. But in very many ways it is. You can it absolutely is, yeah. analyze good uh, photographs and figure out like why are they good. Like, how right. is the foreground, middle ground, and background used? How is the isolation of the subject used? What is the sort of the off thing, the thing that's like the weird angle or the offsetness or the rule that you broke in this particular photograph that made it unique and special? Mm -hmm. And those are, are very much the same things. Absolutely. And I would advocate and I do advocate creativity is actually just a skill like any other. It is not in any sense an innate ability. And you can actually teach people. And we do this in our courses. You can actually teach people to be more creative just by teaching them a framework of thinking. And I think it's very similar to your framework of thinking. I also have to say, just interestingly enough, like speaking of memory and mnemonics, as you were talking about the feedback loop of going around the track and knowing within two minutes, I had this weird flashback to the first time I read your first book, Getting Real, to the exact hotel room that I was reading in in Thailand. And I was sitting with, I was traveling at the time with my software developer who was coding in Ruby on Rails. And I go, dude, you got to read this. This is brilliant. Like, what if we just iterated so rapidly that you always had feedback? We had this epiphany moment. I think that's really interesting that that skill has transferred also onto the racetrack and into photography for you. Yeah, I think that the way I think about this notion of 
figuring out the domain is the idea of developing an eye for something. I remember when I first got into photography, I, as most people, they could look at a great photograph and go like, that's a great photograph, but they couldn't tell you why. And then they could look at a poor photograph and they'd go like, yeah, that doesn't look as good, but I don't know why. And the answer is usually that there are answers. There are very specific things. There's lines, there's uh, golden thirds, there's um, mm-hmm. white balance, there's subject isolation. There's all these very specific actual technical definitions of why something is good, at least from a technical sense. I mean, there's also some sort of the unknown creativity element that um, sometimes you can even break all the technical rules and you can still make a great picture. But for me, what I was interested in at the outset was to just be able to make great technically proficient photographs, right? Things that looked Mm -hmm. as good as if a professional photographer had taken them and color graded them afterwards. Like, and all those skills are absolutely learnable and they're learnable by developing the eyes as you see it. Like now I look at a, um, and and sometimes it's a bit of a curse. Like I look at a photograph and I, like if the white balance is off and it's like either too tinted in either way, I just go like, ah, it just like hurts my brain. Right. (laughs) It's the same thing in programming. Like I will look at a piece of code and I will just see, like I've developed an eye for a, a composed method of how big it should be and what the naming should be and the clarity of it and like, when I see a piece of code that does not live up to those definitions of technical proficiency, I just go like, ah, it hurts my eyes. Wow. And I think developing that <laughs> eye is just one of those critical elements that when you get there, it seems easy. Like now when I, I mean, I mostly do photography that doesn't make it to the web or elsewhere because I just, I take family photos mm-hmm. and they're mostly just for me and my family and for us to document and cherish the experience of having kids and watching them grow up and, and so forth. And it's just sort of, you get into this moment, you have this eye for it and then it seems easy because you know, instinctively they become sort of uh, gut responses, even though they're real things, they're not just like subjective, whatever. But now once you have that eye, mm. you can, in a snap moment, you can make something good. And I think that that's where you need to get to where it's not a, that conscious of a process, or at least it's not a conscious process all the time. In certain domains, like race car driving, it can't be a conscious process at all. You just don't have time to analyze, oh, well, the way I take this corner at, at 140 miles an hour, it works because I trail brake at the last 20% of it, and then I actually did a double take on steering such that I leaned over the weight of the car to the outer wheels, and that gave more traction. You can't think through it like that, right? You just have to get to a point where you've developed an eye and then it's uh, it happens automatically. Right. It becomes essentially a, a pattern of neurons firing. Yes. You've mapped all or wrapped all your exactly. uh, myelin around these uh, connectors and they just fire really, really quickly. You've upgraded your CPU from running like 100 megahertz to running 2 gigahertz. And all of a sudden things seem slow, <laughs> which... It's funny because I get this with race car driving. In, in some cars, you can have a passenger and you can take him out, right? And when I take out a passenger, I, I usually think like, all right, I have a passenger. Like, I should take it easy, right? So for me, taking it easy is driving around at 95%. And almost every passenger I've had out who is not used to being in a race car and a racetrack, they go like, <laughs> dude, you're out of control. Like, this is f- like we're just a second away from crashing. And it's because they're perceiving that experience at 100 megahertz. I'm perceiving that experience (laughs) at two gigahertz. So for me, we have all the time in the world. I can enjoy the scenery. I can keep a conversation. It's not hard because everything just happens so much slower for me, right? Which, again, this isn't about me being magic or special. This happens for everyone who's good at anything. You ask any person, especially in in sports, about like, oh, was that like a really hard shot? Or do you have to think about like, and they think, no, what? What are you talking about? Like, this is easy. And it's easy because everything happens at two gigahertz. Right, which is the flow state. I mean, what you just described, the passenger is obviously not in the flow state, but you as as the driver are very much in the flow state. And there is literally, I mean, you want to talk about general relativity, there is a slowing of time and this effortless, I mean, that this is how Chiksamahai describes flow as the most difficult tasks become effortless. Time seems to slow. You lose all perspective of the outside world. And that's almost exactly what you just described, even when you're going at 95%. Absolutely. And I think you have that flow and then you also have this sort of residue of flow, which is, I mean, I'll have flow state, but I don't have flow state all the time. And Mm -hmm. in fact, to some degree, when I'm in the car going 95%, it isn't so much of a flow state 
it would have been if I went 100%, right? Like I think for flow state, you have to be reaching for something that's just at like the peak of your ability or, exactly or preferably right. even a little beyond. But then that leaves this residue that you can access 95% of that achievement and it still has all those attributes of it being easy and seemingly slow and so forth because you've wrapped your myelin so effectively around those neural pathways that you're just firing so goddamn quickly. And that's why it, sometimes it, it's tough for me to remember like being bad at driving <laughs> because now when I get in a car and I, I go 95%, whatever, it just seems so easy. And I go like, why was I not able to do this like five years ago? What was different? <laughs> and it's exactly that. It was like, I started out at hundred megahertz and I, I ended up at two gigahertz and like a CPU that runs at two gigahertz doesn't think about like, oh, well, I used to run my computations so more quicker. They just, <laughs> like, this is what they do, right? Like this is in the nature of the beast. Like that's just the way the neurons are firing. You don't really think about it in terms of like, oh, this is hard. Wow. So that's the thing that sometimes makes it hard to be a good and efficient teacher. And I think sometimes I am a bad teacher, certainly when it comes to teaching people how to drive a race car, because I've lost contact with, or I have to imagine like, oh yeah, like doing this particular element of driving a car is really hard when you're a beginner. You, you really have to spend time to retroactively study what was these humps to get over, which is why yeah. being a good educator is not something that just comes natural to most people. That's a skill in itself. That's developing an eye. That's developing a sort of a language and a set of patterns of realizing how do you help others get to that point. Absolutely. You seem very well read on the whole flow and neuroscience and everything like that. I have to ask, do you have a big reading habit? Absolutely. I think uh, definitely around personal development and specifically the science around talent and experience and happiness, mm -hmm. basically, was how I got there. One of the quests I've had for a long time is to design my lifestyle in such a way that it's sustainable and filled with as many happy moments as I can cram in, not in a hedonistic sort of threat melt kind of way, but just in a sort of steady state of constantly good experiences. So I spend a lot of time just trying to figure out both from neuroscience and from philosophy and these uh, studies of uh, flow and so on, how can I get more of this? Because once mm -hmm. you've tasted flow, for example, you want more, like it's like crack yep. cocaine, right? Like you want to get back into that damn flow state. So I've tried to put myself in situations as often as possible where I can get there. Race car driving is one, photography at times, programming at times. There's a lot of domains where there's like, you can make it happen. You can get flow there. And then I try to avoid and cut down on the things that I've found that don't produce flow, where I won't mm -hmm. get flow. And I think that that is one of the, tricks or secrets to the longevity that I've been able to enjoy in both programming and in business and so forth is to constantly try to refine the process itself and the tasks that I do within that domain. And some of the time it just means like, okay, like I've done this for 12 years now. Like I don't need to do this aspect of running base camp anymore, for example, mm -hmm. like that's not producing flow for me on a, on any basis. So let me cut it out and replace it with something that has the potential to. Brilliant. Brilliant. So let me ask, are there any kind of skills, routines, or habits that you practice in your daily life, the kind of day-to-day -day things, things like meditation, things like a specific diet that you feel enable you to perform at such a high level? Yeah, there's a bunch of things, both physical things and psychological things. I think on the physical side, I'm very thankful to have a wonderful wife, Jamie, who cares a lot about nutrition, is a wonderful cook and prepares fantastic healthy meals and absolutely I can feel the difference like when before I met my wife and when I was uh, just making food for myself uh, back in the dark days like <laughs> the difference between eating fresh healthy food and eating the shit that I would eat when I didn't want to spend any time on it is astounding and it's a absolutely a great basis and I think it's one of those areas where Unfortunately, we're currently, I think, caught a little bit in no man's land where like traditional medicine and investigation has not paid that much attention to diet. Like when I go to the right. doctor and I have my yearly checkup, does he ask about what I eat? No, he doesn't. That doesn't mean he's, he's a bad person. He doesn't care. It's just, it's not really part of their curriculum, right? Like it's just not really on the radar in the same way that I think it should be, right? Right. 
And on the other hand, unfortunately, too, you can also easily go overboard. There's a lot of dietary plans that I think are not only they're not helpful, they're harmful. So I try to just vary diet of the freshest ingredients you can get and with not a lot of other stuff. And I mean, that takes a lot of time to prepare. And I'm just, I'm thankful to <laughs> be able to do that because I share my life with someone who cares really deeply about that. So I think that's probably one of the most important things on the physical side. I do sort of prior to racing season in particular have a somewhat regular, well, not somewhat, a regular workout schedule where I work out three times a week and especially do strength training and endurance training. Mm -hmm. But on the psychological side, one of the things where I, again, sort of like learning, there's a lot of core truths that people have studied for a long time and codified and I stumbled perhaps into on my own and discovered as it comes to keeping a sound mind, it was a little bit of the same. And when I found the principles of stoicism, yep. that was really where I went like, oh, those are the words, like those are the techniques I've been trying to do for a long time. One of those things is uh, negative visualization. So imagining that the worst happens. In your personal life, in business, in your hobbies, in sports, and then coming to terms with those things up front, ahead of time, such that yes. when they do invariably hit to some extent or other, they don't destroy you. And mm -hmm. I've had that, for example, I wrote something up, uh, I don't know, a couple of months ago, maybe a year ago about the business where with Basecamp, like, I often think about like, okay, this could all be over tomorrow. Like we could go out of business tomorrow. We could f something up so terribly on the technical side that perhaps we lost all data. I mean, we've taken all the precautions and more to prevent that from happening. But has in the history of time that happened to companies? Yes, it has. Yep. It could happen to us. We could miss the market. The underlying trends could change. Like there's all sorts of things that could happen that would take us from where we are now to going out of business. And yep. I mean, that's incredibly realistic, right? Like most businesses, if, if you look at them, how many of them survive 50 years? Like a tiny, tiny minority. Right. So it actually is the majority chance that we will go out of business at some point. So <laughs> I try to look at that and say like, okay, that's probably going to happen. How can I deal with that? One of the ways to deal with that is to visualize it as it actually is happening and then figure out ways to cope with that. One of the ways to cope with it, I've used it, is to just look at like, well, okay, let's say it ended tomorrow. Then I had 15 wonderful years of working with Jason and working with now the 50 people we have at the company on all these different products led to Ruby on Rails. Like, that's amazing. Like, yep. this legacy will be there whether it all ends tomorrow or not. And nothing can take that away. And even if I had to go back to working for someone else and find a job somewhere, like, that would still be there. Like, that would still be part of the time I, I had spent on this earth. And that would be wonderful. So, if that's all true then perhaps if the catastrophic thing happens, it isn't so catastrophic. And I find that that technique of visualizing all those things on a continuous, frequent basis works wonders at reducing anxiety, works wonders at eliminating fears. And just, I'm not afraid of a whole lot of things because I've already lived those things in my mind. I've already yep. visualized all those things. I mean from crashing cars to losing limbs to all sorts of calamities that people think like, oh, why would you think of that? Well, I think that's part of the stoic brilliance and counterintuitiveness that if you actually think about these things and come to terms with them up front, they hold no power over you. And you can rid yourselves of anxieties and fears and just put it in a, in a box somewhere and like, okay, I've, I've thought it all through. I've come to terms with that. Like this can happen. And like, okay. Yeah. And having contingency plans, I'm actually going through the exact same thing now where I say, you know, this is all almost too good to be true, getting to do what you love with the people you love and impacting people for a living and so on. It could all go belly up so fast. And I've been working through like, what is that contingency plan and how will I maintain kind of that gratitude if it does? <laughs> Absolutely. I think uh, just being prepared and thinking about the worst thing that could possibly happen and coming to terms with them is a great way to get them out of your life. I think uh, it's kind of like um, getting things done, that yep. uh, approach to productivity that was popular in the mid 2000s, where for me, at least the central insight was get tasks out of your head 
onto some system, a notebook or whatever have you, just mm-hmm. that you're not in your head and wasting precious brain cycles. It comes yes. back to what we started thinking about which or talking about, which was like, oh, how do you get a lot done? Well, you try to focus on as few things as possible at the time. And you cannot do that if your brain is cram packed full of like, oh, here are all these tasks that I need to remember to do. Here are all these anxieties that I'm carrying around. Here are all these fears that I have to hold on to. Like then it's just full. There's just not that many cycles left to do the creative, interesting work that uh, eventually is going to get you into a flow state and uh, hopefully is going to make you happy. Absolutely. We had actually David Allen on the show and that was my biggest takeaway as well that I sometimes as someone who does memory for a living, I rely on it and I make these little task lists in my head and then realize, you know what? It's like one Slack command to just pop it into whatever system you're using, whether it's Basecamp or anything else. You know, it's just a click away. Just get it out and get it into the real world. Yeah, absolutely. Clear your head and focus your head on just uh, fewer things. I mean, I was overstating things when I said uh, 2 gigahertz and 100 megahertz. It's probably more like 1 megahertz and 5 megahertz. Like we just, sure. Our brains aren't that powerful at this stuff. They don't have that much operating memory. They might have a lots of long-term storage memory, but that's exactly. just not that useful for sort of making progress on things here now. Exactly. So David, I know we're getting towards the end here. I want to ask you, what's your next milestone? What's your next goal? I mean, where do you go from here? It's funny, Jason just posted a post yesterday on Medium that completely echoes my thoughts on this, which is don't have milestones, don't have goals. These are just ways to set yourself up for disappointment. And I found this time and again. When I set up a goal of any kind and I didn't reach that goal, it's like, oh, okay, fine whatever, I've forgotten it five seconds later. If I set up a goal, I do not reach that goal. It's misery and anxiety and like beating yourself (laughs) up and feeling shitty about it. And what did you win? Like the upside is so little. Like, oh, you put down a goal, you meet that goal, you get your money back like 1.05 times, right? You (laughs) set up a goal that you care about a lot and you don't meet that goal. You lose all your money and your house and your dog and your happiness (laughs) for the next two weeks, right? It's just not a proportionate deal. Like, it's really bad odds, I'd say. It's a really bad bargain to be able to win that little and have such calamity waiting for you. So, I try not to have those things. I mean, sometimes it's still hard not to. I think there's just a natural human drive to set those things up. But I try to combat it as much as possible. And then simply setting myself up for these neutral, natural states of tranquility, which is this other technique that, uh, or perhaps aspiration that the Stoics have tried to get people to adopt. That this notion of tranquility where you're not like these on these mega swings of either, oh, it's so terrible that this thing happened or like, oh, this mm-hmm. is so fantastic that I met this goal more just a steady state of tranquility like that's what i'm trying to aim for like a a high baseline but a baseline nonetheless and i found that that comes around most easily when i don't have some grand master plan of something else that like in the ten thousand foot view like i'm happy if i can just continue to do what it is that i do now for the rest of my life so if i can continue to program ruby and rails and work on that phenomenal i'll do that If I can continue to have Basecamp as my business and we can help small businesses get in control of theirs, then wonderful. Well, what is there more to want out of life than that? And I think that that realization that there isn't something waiting in the sky for me to climb up to and that's going to transcend everything that I have right now and turn my life so wonderful is really helpful. And I think that that's one of the things that's been guiding me from the get-go. Like when I first started working on Ruby and Ruby on Rails, I had a tiny one bedroom apartment in Copenhagen with no AC. It's funny, like even just that no AC is, is, a, is a thing I've discovered after to moving to the US where every place has AC, right? But all these luxuries or things or trinkets or whatever that has happened between that time and now, I think, yes, my base level of happiness has perhaps itched up a percentage point or two, but that's about it. And a lot of that comes from just realizing, like, hey, if these things happen, that's good. If these things don't happen, like, what goals do I have to meet to be able to write Ruby for the most of the day? Or to write the things that I think about on the web? Nothing. It takes nothing. Like, I could 
sort of fall in all sorts of ways from grace and heavens. And those things would still be true. I can still do all those things. And even the racing part, if sort of for some reason all the money burns and like I can't go racing in uh, in these series anymore, you know what? I'd probably still be able to buy a old Xbox and go back to <laughs> driving Gran Turismo as I spent many very happy hours doing before I got to this level. And you know what? Things will be just fine. <laughs> if we go all the way back to square one like that. I love it. It's such a wonderful stoic kind of approach. And I, I want to point out this, you have this wonderful balance between, you know, I, I don't need goals and I'm happy where I am and this idea of acceptance and presence. And at the same time, you're like, I didn't see why I couldn't be the best possible, you know, amateur driver on the planet. I didn't see why I couldn't develop a new framework that millions of people could use. And it sounds like you have a healthy relationship with ambition and it comes from your own inner passion. And a lot of people always ask me, you know, how can you be present and still have ambitions and goals? And I always say it comes from doing what you love. The goal is not, I'll be happy when it's, I really freaking love driving this car and I just want to get as good at it as I possibly can forget what the end goal is. I mean, that's not what the goal is for. Yeah, I think this goes back to a lot of that research, again, external versus intrinsic uh, motivation, right? I try to center all aspects of my life around intrinsic motivation, not about other people's validation, not mm -hmm. about trophies and trinkets and awards or accolades or people cheering on Twitter or liking this post or all these other ways that other people take judgment on your work and your life. Thank you very much. I'll take my own judgment and my own verdict on the things that I'm doing. And I feel so much better when I filter all that out. And it goes on both the negative and the positive side that it's not just like ignore the haters, so to speak. It's just as much ignore people who, who love what you do. Not ignore, but just like assign it its appropriate level of influence on in your life, which is very little. <laughs> That's brilliant. Let me ask a, another question on the converse side, which is what is one of the biggest challenges that you're facing right now, either in business or in life? Ooh, good question. I don't really know if I often identify challenges like that, like as humps of things that I need to overcome. And I don't know if I ever have. So it, it's just, it's not really a, a frame of mind or a, an angle that I look at things with. That's a fantastic answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if that, that's really that helpful. It's just not like a way of, of looking at things. I just, I try to do the best that I can and sort of get the best at what it is that I do for the only reason of like that's fun and rewarding. And then everything else will follow from there. That's a, in and of itself is probably the best possible, most informative answer I think you could have given. I mean, it's not because there's a massive thought behind that, but just like that's the, the things that they roll out from my general approach to life and philosophy. Fantastic. Just a couple of questions to wrap up here, David. I wanted to ask you what book or books have most impacted your life? We established that you're a pretty avid reader. Yeah, that's a, it's a hard one to nail down to, to just a couple. And oftentimes some of the more recent books have a tendency to bubble up. I'd say on the technical side, on a very practical level, A Small Talk, Best Practices by Kent Beck is probably one of my all-time favorite books. It's exactly about teaching you that I, the I for good programming and good programming mm. design. So that's really powerful. Uh, another book that I actually read rather recently was uh, Punished by Rewards, which goes into this whole body of research on intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. I is found a lot Dan of... Dan Pink? Uh, no, he had one that's similar called Drive. Right. Punished right. by Rewards is by Alfie Cohen. And it's a little broader than just uh, Daniel Pink focuses all on like business and business 2.0. And like I find some right. of the vocabulary there a little grating. Not that the he references the same study. So it's all good stuff. But Punished by Rewards extends into both child upbringing and schooling, education and business and references much of the same work. Even Daniel Pink references Punished by Rewards. Oh, wow. So just a great book. And Alfie Cohen in general just has a ton of great thoughts on education and motivation that I find um, awesome. And then as far as uh, stoicism, my introduction to that was, I think it's called A Guide to the Good Life or something like that, which mm -hmm. is a broad overview of 
all the major works in Stoicism. And then you can dive in after that into the original sources like Aurelius and so forth. But right. it's just a great way to start in Stoicism with uh, A Guide to the Good Life. It's a recently written book and a good win to dive into. And then finally, perhaps on business, The Intelligent Investor by Graham something, which is a 1950s book about how to analyze stocks and companies and goes over okay. all the core principles of business. And they're absolutely timeless. Great book as well. So amazing That's pickings from some of the different areas amazing david you've been so generous with your time i want to ask just our two wrap up questions here the first and and possibly most important is where can people learn more about what you're doing and get in touch with you i know we're definitely going to put all of your books into the podcast episode and I, i'm going to give a personal endorsement for them because i've read two of the three and they were phenomenal but where else would you like us to send folks sure i'm pretty active on twitter so that at DHH. The same goes for Medium for long form posts. That's also on Medium at DHH. I post things about racing and cars on Instagram at DHH79. And yeah, I think those are good starting points. And then of course, the books. Fantastic. So final and closing question here, David, if people take away just one message from this episode, I can't imagine how they take only one thing away, but let's imagine that they do and they carry it with them for the rest of their lives. What would you hope for that one message to be? It's funny because I've gotten this question quite a few times. And I think the one thing that always springs into my mind is to stop thinking that there's one answer to anything, that there's <laughs> one thing you can take away from anything and that that's a useful way of learning something. As we talked about earlier, if you're developing an eye in any area in business or in racing or in photography or in programming, and you think that there's just this one trick you have to learn, then it's not going to work out. So stop thinking that there is one trick and start realizing that it's a composite of all these things that you have to learn to develop a good eye and get good at the things you want to be good at. Incredible. David Heinemann Hansen, thank you so much for your time. As I said, it's just such an honor to chat with you and just see how much our two experiences have lined up so much and how you are really, really setting the stage for what it actually means to be a super learner. And I think you're setting a wonderful example for everybody out there, just what is capable when you take this approach to life and treat it as a learning challenge and treat it non-traditionally in that regard. So thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you. Sure. My pleasure. Thank you. Take care. All right, super friends, that's it for this week's episode. We hope you really, really enjoyed it and learn a ton of applicable stuff that can help you go out there and overcome the impossible. If so, please do us a favor and leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or however you found this podcast. In addition to that, we are always looking for great guest posts on the blog or awesome guests right here on the podcast. So if you know somebody or you are somebody or you have thought of somebody who would be a great fit for the show or for our blog, please reach out to us either on Twitter or by email. Our email is info at becomingasuperhuman.com. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in to the Becoming Superhuman podcast. For more great skills and strategies, or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.becomingasuperhuman.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time.